may be seated. All right, the young people will make their way. Sit down, Nani. I said the young people are going out, and Nani stood up to leave too. Okay, Hebrews chapter 1 tonight. The book of Hebrews in chapter 1. We have been going through what the Bible has to say about angels, hopefully dispelling some myths and giving us some biblical information. It's always good to have biblical information about any certain subject or topic. We've talked about angels. We began by talking about their creation. And just as a reminder, angels are a special group created by God back before he made those things in Genesis chapter 1. All right, back in the beginning, before he created the earth, he created the angels. They are a special classification, a group of people. Uh, they are real life, real to life things, all right? Uh, they are invisible but they, they can manifest themselves and they can appear. There are angels around us, uh, but we don't see them. And so they can manifest themselves, and when they do, they mani manifest themselves in the Bible as adult males. They always appeared that way. Uh, so the, the little Cupid statues are not scriptural. Uh, the female angels are not biblical uh, every time they appear in the Bible. And the only reason we say that is because people make those things up and then take them farther and farther and farther away from what the Bible says. So we're just establishing that truth. Also, uh, people that pass away do not become angels. Uh, you do not die, get up to heaven, and get handed a, a harp and a halo and, and start playing your songs. That's not, that's not what we do. That's what, don't know about the halos, but the, the harpers harping with their harps. I like that verse in Revelation. Those are the angels up there but not the saints of God. We don't, they're, they're two distinct different groups of people. So we talked about their creation. Then secondly, we talked about their count, how many angels there were, and we looked at uh, the Bible talking, and just as a conclusion, uh, we saw that there was uh, one in different occasions of the Bible, two appeared together, four together, seven together. Uh, Jesus said he could call uh, 12,000, uh, 12 legions, excuse me, 12 legions of angels, which could be, 72,000 if a legion is 6,000, which they say it is. Uh, then Hebrews tells us there's an innumerable company of angels, so more than we can count. There's a whole bunch, let's just put it that way, a lot of angels. Then last week we looked at their condemnation, and we saw that some of them, even after being cast out of heaven in Lucifer's rebellion, went a, a little farther and committed another sin back in Genesis chapter 6, and that group, uh, was confined down to, down to hell, all right, consigned to the bottomless pit, while the other bad angels, and that's the title we put on them, the evil angels, I guess is the biblical term, uh, are free to roam around right now. And so those evil angels are roaming around right now, the good angels are around right now. Uh, if we could see those things, it would scare us to death. And we live unconscious of the spiritual realm that is around us. Uh, if, if we could see it, it would be frightening. It would be worse than any sci-fi flick or movie or anything you've ever seen, if we could actually see that battle that's going on. Uh, there was a, a battle for the body of Moses on the top of the mountain. Uh, angel, the devil and his angels fighting against Michael and his angels, and Michael prevailed. Uh, so all these things are going on, uh, and there was their condemnation. All right, so tonight we come to point number four, the last point, and we might get done with it tonight if we get all the way through point number four, and that is, all right, we know what the bad angels did. They followed Lucifer in heaven when he rebelled against God, and one-third of the angels got booted out of heaven. Two-thirds got to stay there. Uh, they run to and fro, up and down. Uh, Jacob's dream back in the book of Genesis, he had a dream and saw angels on a ladder ascending and descending, going up and down. That means a bunch of them also. Uh, but that's what, the, that's what they do. But the bad ones are are, are restricted in what they do. What do the good angels do? Well, Hebrews chapter 1, look at verse number 13 this evening, and this is what we're looking at. We're calling this their calling, just to alliterate, uh, along with their creation and their count and their condemnation, their calling, and that is their mission, what they do. What do angels do? What do those two-thirds of the created good angels do? 
Verse 13 of, of Hebrews 1. But to which of the angels said he at any time? Sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. Of course, Hebrews 1 is, is talking about the deity of Christ and how he was made higher than the angels and then took on a form lower than the angels to come down here. But then he says in verse 14 about those angels, he said, Are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them that shall be heirs of salvation? All right, verse number 14 then gives us an insight to what the ministry of angels is. They minister to the saints. They are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. That's you and I. We have trusted Christ as our Savior. We are not fully saved yet. We are, we are locked and loaded. We're just not sealed. We're, we're sealed. We're just not there yet. And so we are heirs of salvation, final salvation, the changing of our body. And the angels, the Bible says, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. So we get from this that the, that the, that the overall picture, the job description of the angels is to minister to the saints of God down here on earth. Look back now, if you would, at Matthew. Now we'll run some of these verses and and look at, at how they do that or exactly what is involved in that. And we don't know all of it. Uh, the subject of angels is surprisingly little taught on or touched. Even though, as we said at the very beginning, uh, the word angel appears 203 times in the Bible. Angels is another 94 times. So, so uh, almost 300 times they're mentioned in the Bible. And yet you don't find many biblical studies on them. A lot of information is given, but we, we, we don't get all of it. So uh, Matthew chapter, the one I said, yeah, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus had said in verse number one, who, when they asked him who's the greatest in heaven, Jesus called a little child and set, and set him in the midst and said, I, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of God, whosoever shall... Humble himself as this little child. That's the context. Verse 5, whoso shall receive one of such little child in my name. Verse 6, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones in me. It's better for a millstone to be tied around uh, him. Uh, notice in verse number 10, he says then, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. And uh, we take that as being children. Uh, some, some commentators take that as being like John in First John, as we've seen it, little children talking to young, very young believers. Uh, but the Bible tells us in verse number one, he sat, or verse two, he sat a little child in the midst. So looks like it's talking about literal little children. And he says, for I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. So Jesus is telling us that these little ones have angels watching over them. Uh, angels watching over me, my Lord. Or that's, a, that's not a Bible verse, that's a song. But uh, that's what verse number 10 it seems to be telling us, that in heaven, there, the little ones, their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. So from that comes the teaching, and again, that's, that one verse is the foundation of it, that we have guardian angels. Now, that just restricts them to little children. So do we lose them when we hit 10 years old? Well, no, they are, they are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. So is it possible that when you're born, God assigns a certain angel to you? Like Jimmy Stewart had Clarence. Right? Come on, come on, be with me here. All right, some folks, some, some of you are so culturally challenged, you don't even know that, all right. But everybody gets assigned their angel at birth, and, and we don't know that, but that's the teaching that comes from that. That their little children, the, the, their angels behold the face of the Father that's in heaven. Now, it's not a hard stretch to believe that angels are watching over us to that extent, uh, because that seems to be consistent with what we find in the Bible, uh, before we go on to that, let's, let's, let's point out something. In verse 10 it says this, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels, plural, 
do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Can we say that each person has one angel watching over them? All right, the term angels is used in the plural, and yet the plural is used these little ones, so it's hard to, hard to go any farther with that. Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it more than one-on-one? -on -one? Well, let's look back at Psalm 91. Let's see if we can run this thing down. Psalm 91. Do we have a guardian angel, just one? Psalm 91. In Psalm 91, verse number 11. You'll recognize these verses from your New Testament. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give, here's what David is writing. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. I want you to notice a couple things about these two verses. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Now thank God you've got a King James Bible. Because we wouldn't be able to teach this if you didn't know. We wouldn't understand this because it would say he shall give, uh, uh, he shall give his angels charge over you. We wouldn't know if that you is singular or plural. But we know that the thee, t, thee, thy, thou, is singular. So it's talking about an individual, not a group of people. He shall give his angels, plural, charge over the singular. Well, that means in verse number 11 that that person has more than one angel watching over them. Now, that verse, of course, is used in the New Testament applying to Jesus Christ. In Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4, the temptation of the devil. The devil uh, tells him to jump off the top of the pinnacle and the angels will take care of him. And that verse is quoted in that context. But I don't believe we can look at verse 11 and 12 and say, well, that's talking specifically about Christ. And the new. No, that was a fulfillment of it. But David is writing about himself in verse 11 and 12. He's writing about saints of God in verse 11 and 12. And he says about himself, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. So that would appear that there are more than one angel watching over us. And for some of us, that's a blessing. Because we need more than one angel watching over us. Not on purpose, necessarily. But uh, we need some help from above. So there's a possibility that it's not just one angel, but a multiplicity of angels that's watching over. That is their job, to watch over. And if there's an innumerable company, more than you can count, maybe there's more than the population of the earth right now. Because we can count that. And so these angels, their job is to minister, to watch out for us down here. Now look, if you would, at Revelation. Just to think about these angels being ministering spirits and the possibility that every individual has an angel, either one assigned and then he calls for help when, when you put him to the test. I'm not sure how that works. But we, or we have more than one angel looking over us. But not only do we individually, but notice, and you're, you'll, you'll know this, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. In Revelation 2, 1, the Bible says, under the angel of the church at Ephesus. Uh, verse number 8, under the angel of the church at Smyrna. Verse 12, under the angel of the church at Pergamos. Now you know where we're going, verse 18, under the angel of the church at Thyatira. In Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches all have an angel that represents them. So it's possible here at Bible Baptist Church, we have an angel assigned to watch over us as a church. We need to please that angel. Uh, now a lot of the commentators change that angel to Make, make him the minister, the angel, the messenger, the pastor. And uh, I'm flattered that they would say that the angel is the pastor of the church because no one else has ever accused me of being an angel. But I believe that each church has representation in heaven also, and they have an angel that represents them. That would, and again, this is, some of this is speculation that takes us just in our imagination off to different things, but I bet some angels have been pretty disappointed over the, the congregation they were uh, over, uh, responsible to oversee. 
Uh, I, I was going out to New Concord today and haven't been out that way in a long time. And I was driving out there on Route 22, Route 40, and there's a little church out there, uh, out in that area. I don't know what church it was, Church of God or something. Got a big steeple on it. And now it is a dance studio. Uh, it is something dance studio. I saw it coming soon, and it's got a little advertisement out front. And so that, that church, I, I don't know how long, if it's been empty or anything, but there's an angel that got disappointed right there. Uh, his church just turned into a dance studio. Now he, he's not going to be responsible for it anymore. Uh, so some of our angels might get disappointed by the way things go and things turn out. But here in Revelation, they have a, an angel that represents them. We have angels that watch over us. Uh, look back to Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Let's see these angels in action. That's always the best way to understand it. I guess that'd be a good sermon title. Angels in action. Genesis chapter 19. Angels chapter... Uh, angels... Genesis chapter 19, verse 15. Genesis 19, 15. And when the morning arose, here's, Lot has been told to flee, to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he's, he's hesitant to do it. That's home to him. As wicked and ungodly as it is, it's his home. He's comfortable there. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah had a sin that caused God to rain down fire and brimstone upon them. That's noteworthy. So the angels told Lot, get out of Dodge. Well, not Dodge, but Sodom and Gomorrah. Get out of town. Get out of here. And Lot hesitated. He wouldn't do it. So notice verse 16. And while he lingered, the Bible says, the men, speaking about the angels in verse 15, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. And the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. What did these angels do? They protected Lot, his wife, and his two daughters from the destruction that was about to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah. They had, they had told Lot it was going to happen, and he's still lingering. Can you imagine somebody knowing the right thing to do and hesitating to do it? Oh, I can't imagine that. Sometimes we do the same thing. He's been told what to do, and he's lingering to the extent that the two angels, you say, how come there's two for four people? That's not a good, well, that's all they needed, because the Bible says that the angels took their hands. One took the hand, hand of Lot and the hand of his wife. The other angel took the hands of his two daughters and led them out of the town and got them out to safety. That's the job of those angels, to, to minister to those that are heirs of salvation, to protect, uh, protect us in, in our walk. And so back in Genesis chapter 19, they protected them. Look at Daniel chapter 6. These are examples that I'm sure you would come to your mind if you thought about it, but uh, this is what the angels do. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel is in the lion's den. He's been thrown in there for being faithful to God. The king has been tricked into signing a decree that he didn't realize was going to put Daniel in danger. So the king stayed up all night and fasted and prayed. Then the king went the next morning out to see how Daniel had done in that den of lions. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22. Uh, when the king calls out to Daniel, Daniel says this, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lions' mouths, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocence he was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. My God has sent his angel, and has shut the lions' mouth. So there was an angel responsible for protecting Daniel in the lion's den that came out there and muzzled the lions, and kept them from devouring Daniel. Now that angel did a good job because as soon as this thing's over, those that accuse Daniel get thrown in there and the angel isn't worried about them apparently and they devour him and his as they're thrown down in the pit. So 
the work of angels to protect, to minister to those that are heirs of salvation, to Lot, to his family, to Daniel. We don't find them delivering Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, Pharaoh, but we find them delivering the saints of God. Turn over to Acts chapter 10. No, Acts 12, excuse me. Acts chapter 12. Another story we're familiar with, Peter is in the prison. We saw this recently in Sunday school in the book of Acts, and then I think a Wednesday night message a few, a few weeks ago. But Acts chapter 12, Peter is in the prison. The church is praying for him. Verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. And a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. So he did. And saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee. Here the angel is, is delivering Peter from the prison. And he went out and followed him, the angel, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When he were past the first and second ward, they came to the iron gate, which leadeth to the city, which openeth to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through the street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. The angel's assignment, go get Peter out of the prison. He gets him out. The angel's assignment is done. The, the angel leaves. Now Peter's on his own. Peter, do what you're going to do. He's out of the prison. For a while he thinks he's still having a vision or a dream. He doesn't know what to do. Then he comes to himself and says, and he heads right to where the church is gathering at, at the house of uh, Mary and meets the saints that are there. Now again, verse 7 tells us the angel of the Lord, which makes this really puzzling because the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament uh, seems to be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, which is not going to be true in Acts chapter 12. So that's a whole other thing. But the angel delivers Peter from the prison. And once he delivers him, departs from him. His job is done. The angels are ministering spirits sent to protect us. Uh, and, and, and watch over us. Their job, look at Acts chapter 10, to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. So that would limit their responsibility to save people, would it not? If they're ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. But, here we go, God's foreknowledge, he knows who's going to get saved even before they get saved. God has not decreed who will get saved, but God knows who's going to get saved even before they get saved. So in Acts chapter 10, we find an angel helping someone that's not even a saint yet. But he helps him to become a saint. He doesn't protect him or guide him. He just gets him to the right place. Notice Acts chapter 10. We're talking about Cornelius, verse number 1, a member of the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God, prayed to God always. Verse 3 and he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel, Acts 10, 3, an angel of God coming into him, saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, the angel, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He thought that he knew this was something very special. And uh, the angel said, Thy prayers and thine arms will come up for a memorial. Send men to Joppa, who shall call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he said in the end of verse 6, And he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Uh, Cornelius tells us later in chapter 11, uh, he was called and asked si Simon, uh, he was told where, the words whereby he and all his household should be saved. So this angel is directing Cornelius to send for someone to come and give him the gospel and show him the plan of salvation. He's protecting, he's min the angel is ministering to the saints of God. So their job, as far as we can tell, is to watch over us. Uh, we think of, we're probably not going to get much farther. Look at 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm ready to move on to point number 2 of 4, but we're not done with point number 1 of 4. In point number 4 of the sermon. That's A, B, C, and D, by the way. All right. So looking at their, their, their responsibility, their jobs. 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the king of Syria and his men. They're down in the valley and the king of Syria's encompassed and surrounded them. 
And the servant of Elisha is worried. Uh, verse number 15 of uh, 2 Kings 6. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with the horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? We are surrounded. The Syrian army is here. We're doomed. And he answered, verse 16, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now there's two men, Elisha and the servant. There's an army of Syria surrounding them. And the prophet Elisha says, there are more with us than there are with them. Now that's very optimistic. That's, very, that's the power of positive thinking right there if you ever saw it. But it was, he, Elisha wasn't referring to him and his servant. Notice verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open the eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. When the servant's eyes were opened, you know what he saw? The host of heaven. He saw the angels surrounding, the angels up on high surrounding the army of Syria. That's why Elisha the prophet could say, there's more with us than there is with them. There was a whole host of angels, ministers of fire. Uh, that, that reminds me, keep your place there. Look back at Hebrews 1, where we started. You might say, well, you're stretching that, Pastor, to get those, that, that to be angels in 2 Kings 6. I don't think so. I don't, I don't know who else it could be. But it says they're, uh, they're on horses, chariots of fire, horses of fire. Notice Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 7. Hebrews 1, 7. And of the angels, God saith, who maketh his angels spirits. We saw that in verse 14. And his ministers, talking about them, they're ministering spirits. And his ministers, a flame of fire. So this angelic host in 2 Kings chapter 6 that Elisha sees surrounding them is the host of heaven. They are there to protect Elisha and his servant. Look at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Talking about the job of angels as ministering spirits to watch over us. Luke chapter 16, another familiar story, the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. But notice what it says about Lazarus, the beggar, in verse 22. Luke 16, 22. And it came to pass that the beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. It is the angel's responsibility, it appears, to escort that saint into the presence of God. Here is the angels that, that take Lazarus, more than one, angels, plural. So whether it's his guardian that wanted help to lift him up and carry him up there, I don't know, but the angels escorted him to heaven. These angels have responsibilities to watch over us to protect us, to guard us. One more reference, well, you know this one. Matthew chapter 12, verse 60, uh, 53. Excuse me. Matthew 26 and verse 53. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53. We talked about this in the counting of angels. Jesus is on the cross. Oh, no, he's not. This is before. This is in the garden. When Peter draws the sword, strikes off the ear of the servant, Jesus says to him in Matthew 26, 52, Jesus said unto him, Peter, put up thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou, verse 53, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels. The Lord Jesus Christ in Gethsemane headed toward the cross, there were 72,000 angels, as it were, on call, ready, if the Lord should say he wanted them or need them, ready to come down and deliver him from the situation they were in. That is the job, the responsibility of angels. They are ministering spirits to watch over us, to protect us, and to guide us. 
I wonder how many it takes to help you. I wonder how conscious we are of God's help. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more at the conclusion uh, of these four different things. So that's, that's number one under the calling or letter A, their protection. It is their job to protect us. Number, number two, their job is to proclaim. And this will, this will seem very obvious to you. Their, their, their mission, their job is to proclaim. We'll just simply think about this and not turn to the references this evening, but you know that back in the Old Testament, it was the angels that came to Lot in Genesis chapter 19, came to Lot and told him, God's going to destroy this place. They gave him that message. Their job, the job of angels is a job of messengers. They proclaim a message. They came to Manoah back in the book of Judges told Manoah's wife, an angel came and told Manoah's wife, you're going to have a child. Manoah went to her husband and said, a man talked to me. And Manoah said, what's that man doing talking to you? Now, this is a different translation that you've got right there. But uh, Manoah's husband said, what's that man doing talking to you? Next time he comes, you come and get me. He he shouldn't be talking to you. He should be talking to me. And uh, the next time that angel appears to Manoah's wife, she goes and gets Manoah. Manoah comes, and the angel pronounces to them that they're going to have a son. And they tell him how they're to raise that son. They're to name him Samson. And how they're to raise him as a, as a Nazarene. So the angel is sent to proclaim a message to the saints of God. Again, it's to the saints. It's, it's not, not to the unbelieving part, but to the saints. Fast forward to the New Testament. We know that it was Gabriel, the angel, that came down to Elizabeth and her husband, Eli, and let them know that they were going to have John the Baptist. It was Gabriel who in turn, six months later, came to Mary and told her that they were going to have, that she was going to have a child, John the Baptist. The messengers of God, the, the, the job of the angels is to communicate a message from God. Now that's interesting because all those references are before Pentecost. And then we're going to find a lot of examples of the angels proclaiming messages at the second coming of Christ, the revelation. But we don't read about them saying anything right now. And that's very instructional and very important. Right now, it doesn't look, as far as I can tell, the Old Testament, the Gospels, uh, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, angels appear more times in that book, the word angels, than any other place in the Bible. So their ministry, Old Testament and Gospels, their ministry in the book of Revelation, but a strange absence in between that. And that absence is the church age that's right now. Which draws the the question for me is, what are the angels, what is their responsibility now? You and I have the Holy Ghost. They didn't have that before Pentecost. They don't have that after the rapture. So right now it's almost like the Holy Ghost gives us what we need, Because now if somebody tells you an angel appeared to them, you know what you think? They had too much pizza last night, too much pepperoni. Because we're suspicious of those that say angels. Well, angels appeared to people in the Old Testament. They appeared to them in the gospel. They're going to be all over the place in the book of Revelation. But there's an absence in Romans. How about angels? First and second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, all these books that are covering really Paul's epistles to to us now. You know the only time you read about angels? If if any other angel preach any other gospel than that which you've heard, let him be accursed. (laughs) He's not calling the angels back. Uh, Satan himself has turned into an angel of light. We read about angels in some of Paul's things, very, very little, very, not much at all. But nothing about their ministering, nothing about their work, nothing about their messages and proclaiming. But after the church is taken out, then again in the book of Revelation, the angels are all over the place. Holding back the seas, holding back the rivers, holding back the winds, letting them go at certain points in time, sounding the trumpets, pouring the vials, all over the place. But there's a gap in this age we're at right now. So I'm not sure how that all fits together. I'm going to trust you to take all that and put that study together and come and teach it to us sometime. Are the angels ministering spirits right now for all of us? Are they doing their job? But their job is to proclaim. They are to be messengers. 
Uh, in Revelation, there's an angel flying through heaven, proclaiming, give glory to God in the highest. Look at, look at Luke chapter 2. You, you know it well. Go ahead and look at it. We're getting ahead of ourselves, but we'll do it anyways. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, the story of the birth of Christ. Verse number 13. Again, in verse, verse 9, Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. Verse 10, the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Verse 12, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Verse 13, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There's the message of the angels, all right? There was with the angel a multitude, and they're all saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So they are messengers that, that speak the message from heaven. Now, they don't. Paul says, if any of them do that now, there's a problem. Because they're appearing as an angel of light. Now we have the word of God. Now we have the Holy Spirit that's within us. We can listen to it. And so, again, how that works into the scheme of the whole thing is, is not completely clear. But in Revelation, as we're going to see, uh, there's going to be angels all over the place, flying through heaven, proclaiming things, uh, and announcing things to men on the earth. I'm trying to find the verse real quick that I want, but I'm not sure where it is. It's the last verse in one of the chapters. There's one about them, the angel flying through heaven. There it is, chapter, look at Revelation 8, 13. Revelation 8, 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, John says, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. In Revelation 8, there is an angel during the tribulation, an angel flying through heaven, proclaiming a message. That's the job of angels, to proclaim a message. In the Old Testament, in the Gospels, in Revelation, not so much in the church age, but that is their job and their responsibility. In Revelation 8, verse number 13, it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven. The New English translations of the Bible, like the ESV and the NIV, say, I looked and heard an eagle flying through the midst of heaven. They changed the angel to an eagle. I got into a discussion, debate, I don't know what you want to call it, with someone about this, and uh, the word in our Bible uh, angel is the correct translation of the word that's used in Revelation chapter 8. It's not the same word that's translated eagle in other places. It's an angel. And this very esteemed Bible translator, Bible scholar, said, and this, these are his exact words, whether it's angel or eagle, it doesn't really matter. They both fly. That was his answer. He was on the translation, translation committee of the ESV. And his whole scholarship answer was, it really doesn't matter, both of them can fly. Well, can both of them talk? Because this angel says, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Do, in the tribulation, do animals talk? Do, do eagles fly? It does matter whether it's eagles or angels. It does matter. Every word of God is important in the Bible. And for someone involved in those translations, to, I just thought that was so flippant and so irreverent for somebody to say, well, it, it really doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter. <laughs> every, word of the, every word of the Bible matters. And so their job is to be messengers. So their job is for protection. Their job is for proclamation. That's A and B. We've got C and D, and we'll do that next time. 
because we get in the sea, we'll cut off halfway through it. So what are the angels doing? They're ministering spirits for protection, for proclamation, and for two other things. All right, let's stand together this evening with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, again, your word is so unbelievable, so rich and so thick and so, such a treasure. And Father, tonight we've tried to scratch the surface and come up with some things about these angels just to, to guide our thoughts according to the Bible and not to popular opinion and, and, uh, and views and social media. And Lord, uh, we don't understand all of it. We're thankful for one of these days we will. Lord, we know that right now we're in a, we're in a, a place in, in our life where we're not worried about angels speaking to us. God, we're interested in you, hearing directly from you and what you have for us. So, Father, help us, our, our ears to be attuned and our eyes to be open. We thank you for the, uh, the protection that you have given to those through the angels. We, we thank you now for the protection we have through your presence constantly and through the power of the Holy Ghost that dwells within us. Give us understanding and clarity of thought. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What page do we have, Brother Matthews? Page number 10. All right, page number 10. Maybe next week at the end of this on Wednesday, I'll ask if there's any questions. Woo, I don't know if I dare do that or not on this whole study of angels, all right? Page number 10, let's sing a couple of verses here. Keep me near the cross there on precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain in the cross in Dismiss us in prayer, please.